Now we'll move on to a, a very unique uh, therapy in basivertebral nerve radiofrequency ablation. Uh, Doug already mentioned the basivertebral nerve when he was doing his kyphoplasty uh, spine jack demonstration. That nerve runs right in the middle of the vertebral body, and then it arborizes to the superior and inferior end plate. The indication for this procedure is vertebrogenic pain. So that is pain emanating from the vertebral body. We just obtained a code for it this year, CMS, uh, AMA everybody, so it's 54.51. And we now have a CPT code for this starting January 1st, 2022. Basically the idea here is to take the principles of kyphoplasty, what you already saw from Doug, and rather than cementing or putting in a balloon or putting in jacks, we're now putting in a J-tip curved stylet and then putting a bipolar radio frequency probe through that and then burning the nerve. What differentiates this procedure from RFA of, for example, medial branches, genicular nerves, acetabular shoulder, whatever you guys are doing, is that because the basivertebral nerve is unmyelinated, this is a one and done procedure. So this is not something you have to come back six months, 12 months, 24 months later and repeat. The SMART trial, the treatment arm, was extended out to five years showing not only you know, the same great consistent improvement that they saw at the one year and two year mark, but actually slightly better results as far as VAS and ODI. Um, so again, I, I know we're just showing you the procedures, but I implore you guys to look at the evidence associated with these procedures. This is why I do Vertiflex, this is why I do DRG, this is why I do Relevant, is because they have level one data to support their use. Um, so Doug, if you are ready over there, uh, he's already begun, man. <laughs> so I am ready. Off to a running start. So we've got, um, Greg, I see that other needle. We've got the basal nerve ablation, and this is made by Relevant. And this needle is, has a directional arrow, and this is the direction of the nitinol stylet. And we have the existing stylet, and this comes in either a diamond tip and it has um, a little straight line, or it has an arrow, and this is, the arrow is the beveled tip, and it says the direction of which the uh, distal tip of the needle is moving. And I've started off with the beveled tip because I love my beveled tip, and I love the directional capability of the needle, and we'll go ahead and just proceed on. So this is also a flat approach. This is more of a nine o'clock and three o'clock than it is a 10 and two. So we've kind of started off here and I'm gonna drive it in there. It's a very flat approach and we'll see where we are. Let's take a lateral shot. And once we do this, the night and all wire or stylet will be surrounded by peak. The same peak as an in interbody fusion case, it's just polyether ether ketone. And uh, this is, what we're gonna try to do is hit the center of the vertebral body. And this is half the way up from top to bottom. I really like that approach. And so we're headed, I'm gonna drive it in just a little bit more. We're way far away from the, the pedicle, some medial wall. So I'm gonna straighten the trajectory right about there. And I kinda like, I like that a lot. So we'll, we'll do that, we'll come back around to AP. I don't really like to drive it very far, even though I have a far safety zone, but I don't like to drive it to violate the medial wall until we're in the posterior portion of the vertebral body, exactly the same rules of vertebral augmentation. And so we see we're approaching the medial wall, but not through it. We just kinda, kinda knew that just by reflex. We get down right there to the medial wall, right? And we're right in the center of the vertebral body. And let's go back lateral. And then we're gonna change this out for the stylet. Thank you, Brad. And we'll make sure we're in the posterior portion of the vertebral body. And if we're a few millimeters short, we'll go back around and now we're, we're nailing that posterior portion. Regardless, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the bevel the other way and I won't show you that technique again as we showed it previously. And we're in the posterior portion of the vertebral body. And then I'll remove the stylet. And so this is the direction that is going on the proximal portion. We can see the direction of the stylet. And this is a rotating wheel. And this is designed to uh, protect whenever you mallet the top of this, this is designed to protect it so you don't hit it all the way down. You can hit it to the portion, advance the stylet to wherever you, the uh, predetermined amount of distance based on the wheel and this is the peak, 
surrounding the, the nitinol stylet right at the distal tip here. So in insertion, it takes a little bit of practice to be able to do this, but we insert it like that, and we will see the stylet come out. Is there? I can point it so out to you, Doug, go ahead if, and if you want. Drop it down a bit and see if we can see the vertebral bodies better. We have it still set for the, yeah, there we go. And so we can see the, the stylet that's, that's in, inside the cannula, and that has a throw, that has a predetermined curve. And so you can kind of see where that's angling. And so we'll, we'll tap this a little bit, and we're gonna advance that stylet into the center of the vertebral body. And we'll, the, 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 the direction that we're trying to go is we're trying to go toward the center of that vertebral body halfway up from bottom to top, and 60% of the way back from, from front to back. So we're gonna to try to tag the terminus of the basal nerve, and that terminus is located anywhere from the posterior vertebral body wall to 40% of the way from back to front. And I'm gonna steer this a little bit, and as I steer it, I'm gonna to continue to advance it. And I'm gonna to aim toward that area of the terminus of the basal vertebral nerve. So it's looking 50% up from bottom to top, and at minimum, 40% uh, of the distance from back to front. And so I'm gonna aim this a little bit superior. And if you notice that spatula is foreshortening, it's getting smaller exactly. in width, and that's exactly what we wanna see. Go ahead, Doug. So the, the distal tip on that, the spatula, the expanded distal tip now becomes a dot, and so we know that this is moving directly toward us. So this is about, uh, 70, 75% from the front to the back, and we're 50% from top to bottom. That should be exactly the terminus of the basal vertebral nerve, so that's where it lives. And we're gonna take a shot around AP, so let's go ahead and swing back around. And if all goes well, we'll be at least um, barely across midline to more than across midline. And once we do that, then we're gonna insert the probe, and then we're gonna burn the nerve, yep, so that, that is absolutely perfect. So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna drive it just a smidge farther and I'll take the stylet out and we'll take the probe and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna take the time to burn but I will show you the probe, the probe is here and it's got a distal tip that is bipolar and it's got proximal marker bands and so here are the marker bands, approximately. And I'll show you the significance of these in a second. And we have the distal tip that is a bipolar burn. And we center this over the spinous process in the center of the vertebral body. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in. I'm gonna put it all the way down in. And we're gonna take a picture of that. And so I'm going to pull that back just a, a hair. And see, you can see the distal tip and the, the proximal more por portion of the bipolar electrode is not quite as radiopaque. So we get the small dot right over the spinous processes. And then I'm gonna wheel this back. And what I'm doing by turning the wheel, this is going to take the sheath from covering that probe to not covering it. We wanna make sure the marker bands are now covered up by the sheath to make sure that that thing is completely backed away and is not covering our electrode. And so we'll check the final position of the electrode. I'm gonna wheel back just a tad. I'm gonna go ahead and put that right in the center of the vertebral body. And that is about perfect right there. Yeah, I'd call that perfect. And so we'll go ahead and take a lateral shot and I wanna see the position in the AP on the lateral and after that we'll burn. It's 15 minutes per level uh, and this, again, the position of this is right in the center of the vertebral body on the anteroposterior portion. It's right equidistance between the top and the bottom, superior and inferior end plate. And it's at least 60% of the way, go ahead and drop it down a little bit, 60% of the way back. And this is about, we hit about 70%. So the basal vertebral nerve will be located, the terminus will be that all the way to the back. How far back can you go and still be safe? Well, you can go as far back as one centimeter anterior to the posterior wall. So anything closer than that puts the cauda equina at risk. So some of the data behind this, this is uh, fantastic. It's a smart trial. Uh, Jeff Fishgren was a, 
the primary author of that. Smart trial compared that to sham, statistically significantly better than sham in terms of pain function, quality of life. And the most important part about that segment, that cohort, was the, the sham trial was extended over time. And, the, and the, this has been studied at five years. The last data set is, is, is at seven years. Uh, really, the published data is 6.4 years. But we have patients that, that are out seven, eight years now. And the pain curves, the, the pain goes down, the functional improvement improves, and it kind of stays down, and it stays flat, and it doesn't come back. So. Uh, that, in combination with the intercept trial, uh, the, the single uh, cohort match trial, the single site trial. So I'll give you the, the amalgam of all of this. It's about the most recent data on the two-year follow-up for the intercept trial. That, along with the SMART trial, says this. I, I call it the rule of 75. So in general, patients get about 75% pain relief and 75% functional improvement. Uh, in, out of a 75% response rate, that's what you get, and it appears to be durable or permanent over time. I'll just add, that was awesome, Doug. I'll just add on the intercept trial. That was a trial looking at basal vertebral nerve radiofrequency ablation versus conventional medical management of this condition. It includes meds, PT, steroid injections. And the Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the study after they looked at the data and found it unethical to continue the conservative arm. So everybody had the option to flip into the therapeutic arm, and then they followed those patients out in the crossover, and they did, of course, just as well as the therapeutic arm. So really, the only time you ever see a halt in a study and then really making sure everyone gets a therapy is in cancer drugs, right? If you're comparing it to something else that just isn't saving lives, um, and also in HIV drugs. So in medical device, that's a very unique thing uh, that's a very important statement for this particular and Most of therapy. the time, whenever trials are stopped early, it's because of the F word, futility or failure. But uh, this one was because of the S word, success. So this is uh, uh, something that we really don't see very often in medical device, that's for sure. Great job, Doug. That was awesome. Made it look so easy. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? They're just amazed by your skills. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I saw. Yes. Where does this procedure fit in your treatment? Yes. Doug, so the question is, where does this fit in your treatment algorithm? And if you're walking over, I can start to answer that one. So this is indicated for vertebrogenic pain, which would be symptomatically similar to what you are used to with discogenic pain, so anterior element pain, pain with flexion of the spine, pain primarily associated with sitting, uh, or they notice it when tying their shoes, putting on socks, et cetera, number one. Number two, uh, the physical examination rules out other pain generators, right? So you do flexion extension, you know, Kemp's tests, you rule out the SI joints, et cetera. And then number three, you find the biomarker of modic type one or type two changes. And if you follow those three steps, you have a patient in front of you. Uh, you can do this, you know, at more than just one uh, level of disc or two vertebral bodies. You could do this at three vertebral bodies or four vertebral bodies. Um, and now we have the CPT coding to, to reimburse us for that. The question was, where does it fit in your algorithm? So you have some new back pain and you do an MRI and it either is going to be discogenic or cubogenic pain. So we're talking about stable back pain. So scoliosis, spinal stasis off the table, lines here, back pain that's left over is stable vertebrogenic or discogenic pain. So discogenic pain will be most of you guys, right? Young, healthy, good working people, average age about 35, maybe 40. Vertebrogenic pain, average age goes from you know, 55, 58, somewhere in that range. So if you have somebody that has back pain with motor changes, type one or type two, type three or rare, this is, this is discogenic sclerosis. Hardly anybody has this except way on down the road. So you have patients with back pain, you bring them in, you can try whatever you want to try, right? You know, do, do a voodoo, uh, dance appropriately. Um, and then you try to have a dural injection that's maybe effective, maybe not effective. It's not really good for back pain per se. And then what I do is I do a discogram, provocative and anesthetic. I really do the provocative portion with an anesthetic is that the pain, and then the pain goes from 7 out of 10 to a 0. If the MRI shows motor changes, then the next step is basal vertebral nerve ablation. So 
<clears throat> so let me compare it and contrast this. So before we would just do, you, you'd ask a surgeon, do you do fusion for stable pain, back pain? The answer is no, you know, we never do that. But the answer is yes, most of the time it's done that way. And, and out of all the people who get surgery, most of them are on stable pain. And so the, the surgery really should be reserved for scoliosis and spinal anesthesis. But they do it because there's no option. You know, they're not casting aspersions, there's just no other option. So in this one, you go, you inject the, the, the disc, you know that the pain comes from the disc, you know that it will go away with an anesthetic injection, and then you compare. So what would you rather have, a, a surgery? The data for surgery is basically 50-50. 50% 50, 50, 50 of people get better, 50% of people stay the same or get worse. Well, which you recover from, you might yourself again for a year, and one in five of those patients will have a repeat lumbar instrumentation within four years after the surgery based on adjacent segment disease. Contrast that with what I told you, 75% of people are responders to this. On the average, they get pain and functional improvement of 75%, and it appears to be durable and permanent with no adjacent segment disease risk. So that's kind of where it fits in to the algorithm, and that's why, and that's based on comparative uh, you know, other treatments to compare primarily to surgical treatments. There really is no other treatment for discogenic back pain or t pain. Yeah, that's a great point Doug just made. This really shouldn't be an affront to any of the surgeons. They're all going to say, no, we don't operate on that. He's right, though. A lot of them do, and a lot of them regret that they ever did because they fused someone, and maybe they did well for a little while, maybe. But then at some point, you guys know, adjacent level disease, et cetera, and, and then there you go, the cascade. So this is a huge, huge thing for us uh, to have in our armamentarium. Yeah, so, you know, the Yavin Yoshihar data says it's 60 Two percent of everybody that gets fusion surgery is for something other than scoliosis and spinal anesthesis. So we're not just kind of pulling that out of the bag. And adjacent segment disease, do you know what the rate of adjacent segment breakdown is? It varies. You know, there's a wide range. You know, Park had a paper that varies from five to forty-nine yep. percent, yep. right? It varies from one to a hundred percent. But but the average is about three to fourteen percent per year. So, and it's cumulative. The adjacent segment curve goes like this, and it stops here because that's when they stop measuring it. But otherwise, it continues on and on. So, this is one of the things, that's one of the problems. So, this is, if you, uh, this, this is not a good procedure, it's not uh, a, uh, a wonderful procedure, this is an essential procedure. It's essential for you to be able to do this. Because if you can't do this, and you've just taken off the table a single thing, that has a potential to be completely durable, and 75% of people respond to this, that, that's, that's not so good. So you really need to be able to do this, and you, uh, if you can't, you've given them their only other option is a surgical intervention, or, or persistent suffering, or a pain blocking device. I would rather have a stimulator than with fusion surgery, but if you could get rid of it and have it be durable or permanent, this is a much better tool. So. If you don't do it, you need to be doing it. And I don't want any to leave it stuck. And, uh, I, but I've done this for quite a while. We were part of pivotal trials. And you know, I still see people, my anesthesiologist was one of the first people I did it on. I still do it great like eight years later. And it was like almost suicidal. So you see people on a daily basis that you run trials and I'm like, yeah, I'm still doing great. And I'm not, I'm not surprised after the data has come in. So it's really essential to be able to do this. Yes, breathe. Leaving aside the classical uh, textbook of patient risk procedure with low changes and back pain with fractured and conservative care. That has, um, you know, and, and you're treating basically the end plate. Stepping aside from that, let's say you have a patient with an annular tear. Let's say you have a patient with an annular tear on MRI. You diagnose it, it's painful. You treat the disc with the diagnostic provocative block. Um, patient responds well, but it just continues to be symptomatic. Is this therapy a consideration for an annular tear? I'll give you a firm, I don't know. How about that for a definitive answer? So this is a continuum. You know, so it goes from discogenic to vertebrogenic pain, and it's very difficult to recognize. I'm giving the average age, that's one differentiation point. I've given you the biomarker modic change. You can use a disc herniation, high intensity zone. These are all very important. But the characteristics are very similar. But the patient that is like 
that is like Dr. Phillips here. If he had back pain, can't sit, can't drive, it's worse when he bends over at the waist, especially when he picks things up, worse when he sits, and worse when he leans forward when he sits, puts weights in the hands. I mean, these, this is discogenic back pain. And this is usually, it's seen without modic changes, but sometimes has with modic changes. So you try to use the overall characteristics, the gestalt of a lot of these, and make a decision, is this discogenic? Is this vertebrogenic? What's the difference? Well, the difference in treatment. So discogenic pain doesn't come from the basovertebral nerve, right? Discogenic pain comes from the sinovertebral nerve. Well, the sinovertebral nerve comes with the DRG, comes down, gives rise to the sinovertebral nerve that continues as the basovertebral nerve. So that also explains why the presentations are so similar. So at some point in time, we, gotta, we have to nail this down discogenic, vertebrogenic. Do, and I don't know always, I, out of the 55 patients I enrolled in the VAS trial for ViaDisc for discogenic pain where the pain and functional improvements were profound up to 65% pain and functional improvement, I had about four non-responders, just didn't do anything. Out of this non-responder group, I found that all of these had modic changes. And what did I do? I took them from the ViaDisc trial to the Intercept trial, and had, or not the Intercept trial, I did an Intercept on them, and they did great. So that's just anecdotal, doesn't mean anything. But what it means to me is I probably miscategorized these as internal dis disruption discogenic pain, which when, what they really had was premature vertebrogenic pain. And so the continuum is important only insofar as you have to know that there's a continuum. Everybody, I, I hate to tell you, but all you young, healthy, good-looking people are going to be uh, old, healthy, good-looking people at one point in time in your discs. You're going to go from modified Fearman grades 3 and 4 to grades 7 and 8. And hopefully you won't have pain, but you might. And it's, it would be nice for you guys to be able to have the whole continuum. It's probably going to turn out to be a combination of cellular therapy, maybe uh, gel, all the way to a combination of basovertebral nerve ablation and maybe other forms of intradiscal augmentation. So this is something that when you're, whenever you treat back pain, this is the lion's share of people with back pain. People with back pain and degenerative disc disease, bit, biggest category of all. So I had a colleague of mine say, well, I treat facets, so the facet seems to be the, most of the cause of back pain of most, most of my patients. I mean, no, it's not. It's not. It's just, you know, I like it, but it's not, right? This is a small portion. The lion's share of discogenic back pain is either internal disc disruption, discogenic, or vertebrogenic pain as an amalgam. And once you start working in the disc, treating the disc, then your eyes will be open. If you do that now, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't do that, you will. When you, whenever you start doing this, you'll reflect back to this time I told you, get into the disc and start treating discogenic and vertebrogenic back pain. It'll change your career. Yes. Do you need to have modic changes on MRI in order to get this improved to treat? Yes, you do. <laughs> modic are binary. So, I mean, let's say you have somebody with some degen scoliosis, right? And the curve goes like this. And, and uh, so if they're facing you, this is right and this is left, and they have left-sided back pain, and the concavity is right here. And it's because they have degenerative disc disease in the concavity of their scoliosis along with modic changes on this side, but the sagittal slices through this side show no modic changes. Are there modic changes present? The answer is yes. Modic changes are binary. Either yes, they're there, or no, they're not. And they could be present toward the front, toward the back, Side to side, either there or they're not. So, but yes, you have to have modic changes before you treat with somebody designed to take a, a treatment designed for vertebrogenic back pain. Yeah. Well, before we move on to the next topic, I, I just want to highlight something Doug just talked about. You know, he, he was mentioning those four non responders in the VAST trial with the via disc therapy. That's an intradiscal nucleus pulposus substance. The bottom line, guys, is that wasn't a therapy failure. That was a patient selection failure. Yep. And that is everything. So a lot of people out there think, oh, this device didn't work. You know, XDOP comes to mind. There's so many, I did, you know, whatever device has kind of come and gone. And even some of the things we showed you guys today may, may be gone in 10 years. Who knows? 
but it's not the devices, it's the patient selection. And that's really what this course is all about and, and really helping you guys understand because anything can work as long as you find the right patient for that therapy. So that was a great point. Yeah, patient selection. So I like to use vertebral augmentation as a good, as a good example. It, vertebral augmentation, if somebody has fracture pain, it doesn't fail. It rarely, if ever, fails. It's, if the patient doesn't get better, it's a failure probably right here and right here. You don't see what you need to be looking at. You don't see that fracture cleft that you didn't fill. You don't realize that you underfilled it. On the vertebrogenic, discogenic pain, maybe you throw stem cells into a 39-year-old guy uh, that's a brother of your attorney, and then he just d doesn't get better, persisted a 7 out of 10 pain, even though he should have gotten better because he had a modified Fearman grade 4 with a little bit of motor changes. But then you think, okay, maybe it's actually vertebrogenic pain, and you treat him, and his pain goes from a 7 to nothing and stays there for years. So patient selection is really critically important, and patient selection has to do with knowledge. You see what you look for, you look for what you know. This is a boiled down version of the Nobel Prize work of Hubert and Weasel. And these guys, you, the, it, it, literally, your neocortex is connected to your visual cortex. Your medial prefrontal cortex, you, that's how you see what you look for and you look for what you know, and the way that you're able to get appropriate patient selection is the more you know, the more you see, and the better selection capability you'll have. 